Yeah. I was just uh, uh, just based on a few things you said during your presentation. Uh, uh, I I wanted to start with a couple of questions of my own, and then I thought maybe we'd open it up to uh, the people on the gathered crowd. That sound good? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think since we are actually sitting here in Lakefield and Lakefield College School, and you were a student at Lakefield College, um, you touched on a couple of little uh, tales from school, so to speak. But uh, I was wondering if you had another, you know. Uh, uh, a uh, story about your days here at Lakefield College that uh, you might want to share just with the gathered crowd here today that maybe you don't often share with others. Yes? Yeah, sure. And they had a lot of trouble recruiting people for fundraising events from my year, 69. And that's because Lakefield was going through a fairly large transition. It was kind of going from the 19th century to the 20th, 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> like it was goodbye, Mr. Chips, in 1964, and it was like a, it was like a school after. The, I mean, it was uh, it was like a modern school after. But Jack Matthews was responsible for that, for that transition. And but I really enjoyed the time I spent here. I, I have very good memories of of this place. It, uh, and <clears throat> people in my year have quite quite varied responses to it. But, the thing that was most unexpected getting here, is I was raised in a theater family, and you would think that you would get all your theater training in a theater family. Well, that's not the case at all, because actors are completely self-absorbed people. <laughs> they are not interested in children unless they can be used on stage. <laughs> and an absolutely mercenary view of children. And so I wasn't allowed to, to do much other than play a tree or a, a mushroom or something. And I got here and Andy Harris and Brian Jones came up to me almost immediately and said, we want you in one of our plays. I was in grade nine and I had speaking parts. That was a breakthrough. <laughs> And they, they, uh, they treated me like a theater person, which had never happened at home. I was a set dresser at home, a painter. A painter you know. The reason this theater is called the Brian Jones Theater is because he and Andy Harris did really marvelous theater here in the, in the, the mid-60s. And we went to the, what is it, the, the dramatic festival, the Sears Drama Festival, and, and uh, wrote our own stuff. and. Uh, did magical things in a terrible space. It was the Great Hall, flat floor, vast ceiling, couldn't hear anything past row, row C. Discovered in physics that you could, uh, you could make a light bulb dim by pulling the electrodes out of the solution, ions in solution. I said, boy, I can use that. So I was up the back with 220 circuit electrodes. <laughs> And a beaker and people out the front saying, wow, how do you do that? <laughs> so I was <clears throat> almost sent down for that. But uh, it was a wonderful experience to, uh, to work with two people as committed to the theater as, uh, as Brian and Andy were, and who were also as committed to uh, the encouragement of young people. So I got most of my formal theater training in, in this place. And this, this theater was built really as a result of the, the crowd that went through those, uh, those the, the mid and late 60s, the work that was done. Um, what, what is the relationship between you and the, uh, as the creator of the script and the directors and actors who perform and interpret it? Mm -hmm. You've seen those Davy Crockett films? <clears throat> where he's captured by the, the uh, First Nations, I think was the word. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they strip him to the waist, and uh, the First Nations line up in two lines, and he's supposed to, they all are carrying clubs, and he's supposed to run down the middle, and they all take a swing at him. That's, that's really the, the role that a playwright has. <laughs> and I find that my writing 
has improved the more it has worked over with lead pipes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, in, in a way, kind of uh, the, the uh, revision process that you would put a book through, say, that you have to do yourself, and then uh, editors take a crack at it when you're finished with it. Uh, um, the production of a play tends to add those dimensions to... Uh... I've always kept good company in the theater. I've always had great editors. I've never, never met an editor that I didn't like. And, uh, uh, if I, and by good people, I mean people who have a have a commitment to the work, whatever it is, and are interested in the outcome. You know, I, I, the Wingfield, the Wingfield material has is, is, is had a great success. I'm, I'm very, I'm fond of it. I'm proud of it. And but what, one of the things, one of the accomplishments of my life is my, my partnership of uh, 28 years, 29 years now with uh, with the Beatty brothers. We're still. We're still working together. You know, Gilbert and Sullivan, by the time they've been working together as long as we had, they haven't been speaking to each other for about 26 years. <laughs> it's a very, very dangerous, very dangerous uh, territory for partnerships. And uh, the fact that we've made, made it work all that time is, I think, quite, uh, quite inspiring. I don't think there's nearly enough farmer thinking in our world today. And I feel that I am. Sir, uh, I am the custodian. I am, I am responsible for capturing each example of farmer thinking that comes my way, and I have to. I would be held personally responsible if, if even a small nugget were to be lost. So the, the books are actually. I'm, I'm more of a vacuum cleaner than I am a writer. <laughs> Whatever happened to the U that you brought to Lakefield School? Well, Stan Hockaday took that U. And uh, she lived out her life on his farm as a, in the flock there. And I, I saw Stan many years after. She looked to be about uh, 13, 14. But so she, is she staying here with you while you were in school? Well, not, not in the dorm. She was. Uh, <laughs> There were some rules and curfews for that. <laughs> she went down to the riding stables, and uh, after, and then I, I sold her to Stan for about twenty bucks. So you you weren't allowed to keep the you with you. That's cool. I, I apologize. I I could go sit back down. If you the CBC building on Jarvis Street was my first exposure to human organization, and the, the parking lot at CBC was summed everything up. Because there's a guy there that would say, a little more, a little more, a little more. <laughs> <laughs> that will do. <laughs> and the, the whole building was like that. In my grandmother's circle, the professional theater was um, a kind as of, like going into a bar to her. She had no truck with the professional theater. If you were a, one of her actors and you crossed the floor to Dora Maver Moore and started making a living at it, she would cut you off. She wouldn't talk to you. Again, amateur theater was, she thought, it just the purest form of religion to her. And then you were not supposed to take any gain from it. And uh, Yeah, question up here. And I've always wondered how long it took you, the last day of school, to ride your white horse to King City. Five days. It was a little north of King City. I went to Rosemont in the Mona Hills. Oh, nice to see you again. Uh, the story is, I had, uh, my mother gave me that horse, and the rule was, I buy you the horse, I'm not doing anything more. That's your horse. You do it, you feed it, you look after it, I'm not... She didn't like horses. So I brought it with me to the school. I paid 25 bucks <laughs> the second year. And it stayed down here with Mr. Rashley. Mr. Rashley and I had a special bond. He once confided, he was an old Oxford man. Oxford, was it? And he, he wore John Perth into his Latin class and uh, smoked a pipe and, and talked out of the side of his mouth. And, and he said uh, to me once, 
never did trust a man who couldn't sit a horse. <laughs> and I wrote, I didn't want to pay 25 bucks to have the horse trailered back to Rosemont, so I rode it home after the closing on June the 12th. <laughs> and again, my mother was just saying, well, oh, stay in touch. <laughs> Let me know how that works out. I think that's <laughs> now that's a gift. I, I'm a helicopter parent. Uh, I hover, and it's uh, it's crippling to the children to do that. And uh, my mother, bless her soul, she's still living, uh, was just a genius about that. Like she would not step in and solve any of your problems. And I stayed in farms on the way back and. She was like, I remember Mrs. Kennedy in Little Britain took me in, and the first thing she did was hand me a phone and said, oh, for heaven's sake, call your mother. You had aspirations of becoming what you are doing now uh, at the time you were coming here. Uh, you, you didn't come here to do what you're doing now. In uh, those days. No, I don't know what my aspirations were. Uh, I didn't decide to become a, a writer until I was 37. The last time I was on a stage before that professionally was at the Crest Theatre in Toronto in 1958. I did a production of Macbeth with all the greats, with uh, Kate Reed, Charming King, uh, uh, Paulus Thomas, John Vernon, uh, Raph, my dad played Ross, he always plays Ross. And I was... And I was um, I was uh, Macduff's son. I got murdered in the third act and got a dry seat in the house. And... <laughs> but, but out in the lobby, there was an aquarium with two rattlesnakes in it. And uh, they got out. And they were somewhere in the theater while I was doing this show, and I was like nine years old, and that has an impression, please, that leaves a mark on a child. <laughs> and that in the CBC parking lot, uh, you know, you form impressions of an industry in little ways, and uh, the witches caught fire three times during that run. Martha Henry was one of the witches. Rod's married to uh, Martha Henry. And, and uh, a nurse ran out of the front row and beat out the flames. And, I mean, you know, you do form impressions about it. <laughs> about the, and you listen to everybody, everybody in the dressing room complaining, when will this show be over? <laughs> Let's cook this turkey. And, and at the end they're saying, will I ever work again? <laughs> That's what you find the path towards the insurance industry. <laughs> Maybe that it's, it's uh, safer to write plays than perform them? Yeah, yeah so <laughs> aspirations, that's an interesting idea. I don't know. So, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, how, many, how many people really, when they were in high school, knew what they were going to yeah, be? I think, you know, if you're going to write, it's in you, it'll come up. I want to thank you, Doug. You take me back, and that whole spun philosophy that you articulate to us with a sense of humor was the same type of philosophy and wisdom that I learned from my grandfather and those other farmers, those characters around him. And this really helped me in my life as I had to increase 55 years of dealing with people and all their cards and changes. So yes. I thank you, sir. I thank you. I love you. And I follow you everywhere and enjoy every bit of you. Uh, what perfect timing. I think that's our show. That was, uh...